Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all and welcome back at the Swiss Pavilion. My name is Dante Darini, I'm project manager here at the Swiss Pavilion working for Swissnex. Swissnex is an agency of the Swiss government to promote education, research and innovation abroad. And we do so by promoting our university startups and innovative companies abroad and connecting them with equivalents from the most innovative hotspots in the world. And this is why we are here at Expo 2020, to build linkages with the Emirates, the wider region and the world. And today, we are continuing our series on public health and we are honoured to receive a delegation of healthcare from India to assist our events. And we're also very happy for everybody joining us online. And as a reminder, you can also interact with our, our guests, our speakers, directly in the chat. So without further ado, I would like to present Dr. Emily Reeves, the moderator of the session, who will share a bit more information just now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dante. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm just filling in for Ana Lucia Onya Macias, who was supposed to be moderating the session, but she's now engaged in expo communication of SSPH Plus in general elsewhere. Uh, so I'm filling in for her, and it's a pleasure for me to, to be here and to moderate this session uh, on public health beyond the pandemic. Uh, this is part of the SSPH Plus for Sustainable Health program uh, for the uh, Swiss Pavilion that we have lined up. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, uh, as Dante mentioned, I'm uh, Emily Reeves and I'm the project manager at the Swiss School of Public Health. The Swiss School of Public Health is the national coordinating body for the promotion of postgraduate research and education. Uh, in Switzerland, we have uh, 12 universities with which we are affiliated. And today, uh, as I mentioned, this session is all about public health beyond the pandemic. This means we are inviting our experts from Switzerland, from our community uh, associated with SSPH Plus uh, to uh, discuss this interesting topic and very, very relevant topic for today from uh, their own experience, from their own research. And our first uh, speakers that I have the pleasure to invite uh, to join us uh, online uh, directly from Switzerland uh, are um, Barbara Birkin, uh, she's a PhD candidate from the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute and also uh, joining her uh, for a joint talk is Dr. Eva Mertens from the Global Partnership Initiated Biosecurity Academia for uh, Controlling Health Threats, GIBACT, and Bernhard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine in Hamburg. So it's a great pleasure to, to have you joining us from uh, online from Switzerland. And uh, without further ado, I pass the floor on to you both. Thank you. If you can unmute your microphones, you may begin. Thank you so much, Emily. I hope um, you can hear me well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Yes, it should work. Um, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, on behalf of the entire GIB8 Consortium, I would like to warmly thank everyone for the great opportunity to speak to you in this special setting and in front of this extraordinary audience. I will be joined by my esteemed colleague, Dr. Eva Mertens, Program Director of GIB8, who will introduce herself later. My name is Barbara Maria Burki. My background and specialization is in public health and health education. I work at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute, where I coordinate an MBA program in international health management. In parallel, I'm completing a PhD on the topic of transformational leadership in low and mid-income countries. 
In 2013, the German Federal Foreign Office launched a German biosecurity program under the auspices of the G7 Global Partnership against the spread of weapons and materials of mass destruction. The program aims to sensitize for and minimize risk from biological pathogens in partner countries, including natural, accidental, or intentional incidents. The program encompasses a range of projects implemented in cooperation with, with German institutions, such as the Robert Koch Institute, the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, the Bernhard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine, the Friedrich Löffler Institute, as well as the Bundeswehr Institute of Microbiology. The following diagram shows the methodological approach of the German biosecurity program with its components, awareness raising, networking, biosafety and security, detection and diagnostics, as well as surveillance. In this context, the global partnership initiated Biosecurity Academia for Controlling Health Threats program was launched as one of the two supra-regional projects of the German biosecurity program. It is coordinated by the Bernhard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine and conducted in partnership with the Robert Koch Institute, the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute, as well as the African Field Epidemiology Network, AFINET. So what is GIP8 about? GIP8 is a cross-state one-year training program for biosafety and biosecurity, which aims at a sustainable, long-term implementation of the acquired skills in the individual working environment of the participants. In order to strengthen national capacity in disaster management and preparedness, GIP8 sensitizes for biosafety and biosecurity issues. One of the core elements is the development and multiplication of context-specific biosafety and biosecurity-oriented case studies and trainings. Through its structure, objective, as well as thematic focus, IP8 contributes significantly to SDG 3 to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, as well as SDG 17, to strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development. Thus, the GIP8 program builds and sustains partnerships with institutions and countries in need of education in the role of biological threats. A little bit more information about the origin of our GIP8 fellows. GIP8 is not specifically geared to one country or its characteristics but it is designed to be transnational as participants from multiple countries come together to share their challenges and experiences. GIP8 targets public health professionals from the target regions Africa, Middle East, South Asia and Central Asia. In seven cohorts, GIP8 has trained around 110 postgraduate public health professionals of over 27 partner countries in Africa, the Middle East, as well as South and Central Asia. The GIP8 program follows a blended learning concept, which combines asynchronous as well as synchronous learning phases. The methodological and didactic spectrum includes self-administered topic-specific e-learning modules, face-to-face -face workshops, with mostly interactive case study and scenario teaching, as well as distance-based group and individual work. In addition, GIP8 offers its fellows an electronic alumni platform to foster the future collaboration between fellows, but also facilitators and teachers. An integral part of the blended learning concept of the GIP8 program is the case study module, which involves the development of context-specific case studies with relevance to biosafety and biosecurity. These case studies are intended to address the special requirements and needs of a certain country and the professional working situation of the participants. 
They serve as educational material for basic training, advanced training or continuing education to teach health professionals and policymakers at different levels of the health system. As part of our training of trainers concept, the case studies are available to participants as teaching material in their working context after completion of the program. The case studies are mostly directed at outbreak situations and their response. In this context, the case study module has a direct impact on capacity strengthening in the context of fighting pandemics such as COVID-19. Our long-standing experience with the integration of synchronous and asynchronous learning phases within a blended learning concept made it possible to adapt and continue the program even under the challenging conditions of a, pande of a pandemic like COVID-19. For example, the face-to-face -face workshops during the synchronous learning phases, which were previously held on site, were converted into a virtual format by the, by the asynchronous elements could remain as before. Please see here a few photos of past cohorts. With the start of COVID-19, from one day to the next, scenarios such as those of a pandemic, which were previously only trained with help of simulation exercises and case studies, have turned into reality. I would now like to hand over to my kind colleague Eva, who will talk more specifically about the contribution Bart has made to the fight against the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. Um, yes, my name is Eva Mertens. Um, as mentioned, I, was, I work at the Bernard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine in Hamburg, Germany, and I'm the director of the Gibach Consortium. Um, as Barbara already introduced, um, we were able to build uh, a strong capacity foundation uh, with Gibach in the years before the pandemic. And therefore, we were able to use um, existing networks and just jumpstart a rapid and efficient control measures once the pandemic hit. And one of them is the COVID-19 strategy, short COST-19 initiative, uh, which I will introduce now. So in early 22, um, a survey among our Gibacht alumni network revealed that many of them were actively engaged in the COVID-19 response and many express the need for additional capacity building and training opportunities. So with the support of our funder, the Federal Foreign Office, we were actually able to offer additional funds for COVID-19 support um, in partner countries. And we initiated a call on our alumni platform and our alumni could apply for funding for, for small projects that were aimed at the containment, control and prevention um, of, on of ongoing or further COVID-19 outbreaks in their countries. And this initiative supports two types of training measures. And the first were face-to-face -face simulation exercises, which provide in-depth training for healthcare workers and also technical staff that are directly involved in COVID-19 outbreaks, outbreak prevention and control. And the second uh, measure were information campaigns to improve knowledge regarding COVID-19 among the general public. And out of 28 submitted proposals, six were selected and successfully implemented by the Gibacht alumni in 2021. And I'm now going to introduce these selected programs, projects, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yes, first, so first I'm going to present the simulation exercise projects. The first is coming from the Gambia by our uh, alumni, Ab uh, Abdullahi. And his proposal expressed the need for reducing the currently high risk of exposure to COVID-19 in healthcare facilities. And as part of his project, he conducted a three-day training in a district hospital consisting of uh, both classroom teaching, which is pictured here on the right. And no, please go back. Sorry, you went back to the next to the for the following slide. Um, and also, he did a field exercise at the hospital entrance on screening and triage of people entering the hospital. So Baba, could you go back one slide, please? Yeah, no, back <laughs> to Gambia, please. The audience were 15 people consisting of public health officers, 
nurses, security officers, IPC, uh, infection prevention control personnel, and also healthcare workers covering all facilities in the in the region. The increase in knowledge gauge, gained from the training was ascertained by a pre-post test and the average scores increased from like 45 to over 80 percent. Also, the regional health director, uh, the regional director of health services um, endorsed this training and it is planned to be replicated in all regional health facilities. Next slide, please. The second simulation exercise was conducted in Ghana by our alumni Fortress, and her project addressed the need of uh, lack of training of frontline healthcare workers in surveillance, um, infection prevention and control, and also in risk communication. And so she did um, also, um, a, a, in this, this case, a two-day training in the use of the e-health software SOMAS and Open Data Kit uh, to improve COVID-19 data management and completeness. Also, she used um, the, our tool of case studies, which Barbara already introduced, as a practical exercise to train risk communication. And also, as you can see on the top picture here, there was a, a personal protective equipment demonstration and standard guidelines, uh, infection prevention control were introduced. Here, the audience consisted of 39 surveillance officers and health information officers. Um, and as for the first project, also this training will be multiplied um, at district level. Next slide, please. The third training comes from our alumni Mohammed from, uh, from Afghanistan. He also expressed the need of his country to reduce the risk of exposure to COVID-19 in healthcare settings. And he also organized a training that included lectures on COVID-19 biology, but also surveillance and control, as well as biosafety and biosecurity elements. He also conducted a practical exercise, again, a case study for screening and triage for COVID-19 infections, and also a demonstration, as you can see on the top picture here, um, of um, protective equipment. And um, to as a proof of the success of this training, uh, triage stations were established in two laboratories and one teaching hospital as a result. Next slide, please. The, the following three projects I'm presenting are the other type of training I mentioned, um, information campaigns. And, and the first comes from, from Kenya, from our alumni Kennedy. Um, this project addresses the fact that most important, uh, most information on COVID-19 control is uh, directed towards adults. And this project has the aim to make COVID-19 information appropriate and also understandable for children, and also to improve hand washing and mask use in schools and kindergartens. So he designed most of this information. And as you can see, um, the posters kind of use the role of uh, the children to be superheroes to protect uh, themselves and also the community. Can they conduct qualitative and quantitative data analysis on the usability, usefulness, effectiveness of these posters? And the final results you can see here. In addition to the posters, he also provided the schools and kindergartens with face masks and hand sanitizers. In total, 50, 50 kindergartens were included. The total audience reached for over 3,000 children and over 80 teachers. And also the, the households of um, the children were, used, uh, were, were, were counted as secondary beneficiaries in this, in this initiative. There was very positive feedback from the kindergartens. Um, there was a behavior change observed with regards to hand washing and using masks. Of course, the social distancing uh, with, uh, with, with children is a little bit more difficult to, to achieve. Next slide, please. The second information campaign comes from Ghana, from our alumni Maria, and her proposal mentioned the lack of COVID-19 risk communication among market sellers and community members. And to counteract this, she conducted interviews with market sellers and customers at the central market, discussing uh, perceptions, knowledge, and behavior towards COVID-19. And these interviews, together with feedback from experts, were edited into a 45-minute recording and published by a community radio station. And, and the recording of this, you can see in the top picture here. Um, in the following, there were two live radio discussions with medical doctors addressing community perceptions and beliefs around COVID-19. And in addition to this, uh, to this, um, to the public, um, to the radio show, also hand washing stations and face masks were donated to the central market, which you can see here on the bottom, and it even says Gibacht in the 
cost 19 on the on the station so that yeah <laughs> this was a nice addition um, the project received very positive feedback from both callers to the radio, but also from market sellers and the community, and the radio show has been replayed um, a number of times. And next slide, please. Last but not least, the final information campaign, campaign comes from our alumni Zuba Ia from Pakistan. Unfortunately, he didn't send us photos, so this picture is from the Gibacht uh, archive. And he had expressed a lack of risk communication around COVID-19, which hinders individuals and families to make uh, informed decisions and take up health recommendations. So he conducted training and lectures on COVID-19 infection and prevention control and also COVID vaccination, answering the really basic questions, what is COVID-19, how is it spread, what are preventive techniques, and what uh, are the benefits of the COVID-19 vaccine. She also demonstrated um, personal protective equipment usage to an audience of nursing school students, midwife school students, and also community members. And he reports that after his training, the demand of vaccination increased by, by 25%. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, as our conclusion from this um, initiative, um, these micro projects really reveal to us the different levels of needs um, from the different countries, ranging from lack of information, problems to also the misinformation and infection control. It also strongly demonstrated both the motivation and also the capacity of, of our Gibach alumni to act as multipliers in their networks and respond to health emergencies. It showed that through Gibach, sustainable structures had been built that could now be relied upon to respond to COVID-19 and also to other outbreaks. And Gibach succeeded in strengthening national capacity in disaster management and preparedness. And uh, with that, I would like to, um, to thank the German Biosecurity Program for enabling this initiative. Um, next slide, please, Ava. Also, I would like to thank our COS-19 awardees for their thoughtful submissions and successful implementations. Um, of course, also a thanks goes to the other GIVAC consortium members. I added our contacts here in case you would like to get in touch to find out more about our program and our teaching approach. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm just reading that there were some sound issues. I hope you could hear me well. Uh, we could hear you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the sound issues on your side, but we did hear you perfectly and we were very interested. Thank you so much uh, indeed for your talk. Um, at this point, um, we are a little bit behind schedule because we started later, but um, we do uh, indeed have time for a question. Should anyone be interested in, in, in asking a question? Um, I uh, pass the microphone over. We do have someone here with us who would love to ask a question in the front row. Um, and we're ready for questions. <laughs> Perhaps you could introduce yourself and, and offer a question. I am Professor Vaikya Gupta from India. I, I wonder that nobody has made a project on vaccine hesitancy, which is one of the important issues in India. We tried to counter it by giving lots of public lectures, radio shows, TV. And second thing, the use of antibiotics has gone up unnecessarily, which will lead to antibiotic resistance. We did that also in India. And lastly, the issue of self-medication in uh, in COVID-19 time, a lot of people did that because they did not want to Maybe go for Maybe it's me, but I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> oh. You are muted. Okay, now you should be able to hear us. Sorry for that. Uh, should I repeat? Okay, my question, I am Dr. Vaiki Gupta from India, Professor Vaiki Gupta. We in India have three important public health issues related to COVID-19. One... Um, okay, may I just... Can you hear me? So I think... Um, yeah, okay, if I, you can hear me also. I'm not sure whether I got your question uh, clearly. May, yeah. So question number one is... 
we in India and I think globally, the vaccine hesitancy is an important issue. We did a lot of effort through different media, giving talks to community to reduce it. So was there any attempt towards that? B, a lot of antibiotics have been unnecessarily prescribed, which may be a cause of antimicrobial resistance, which is which is an underlying pandemic, say, you can say, bomb, which is nobody is, if people are, may find it later difficult. And third is issue of self-medication, which requires education in public health. Over. Yes, I can definitely say something towards the vaccine hesitancy. Um, so this was not really um, as much reflected in the proposals that we received, but this is probably also due to the fact that the the call for this was uh, in the early phases of uh, when where vaccination was available. So probably it wasn't yet very um, it wasn't it wasn't really a big problem back then. <laughs> I think proposals would look very different now and would address that um, a lot more. So here there was only the the one um, project from Pakistan that addressed that a little bit. Uh, that was really geared also towards uh, inc um, increasing vaccination rates. Um, the fact of the self self medication and uh, prescribing prescribing antibiotics. Yeah, this is this probably goes together with the yeah the misinformation that was um, that was part of some of the proposals that were going to be addressed. But again, it it wasn't a big a strong focus, but this was probably due to the timing. <laughs> Barbara, maybe you, if you want to add something, then go ahead. I think it's perfectly, um, <laughs> thanks uh, for um, perfectly answering that question. I was just, uh, I just wanted to say that usually this is, uh, was the part when I was talking about the case study, such uh, topics are covered and then like incorporated in, in topics that are covered within our case studies and simulation exercises where we really then try to um to make use of the yeah of the context that participants face in their working context and then this would be definitely an issue that could be addressed there and also cultural differences and uh, yeah, specific needs because we also saw i mean given our very heterogeneous group of participants from different countries that it's really very different also given the, the COVID uh, situation in the different countries when it comes to vaccine hesitancy. But this would definitely, um, yeah, a, a topic as said to, to pick up in one of the case studies when it comes more to awareness raising um, campaigns, for example. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you both very much for having joined us online and for taking the time to answer questions. Unfortunately, we don't have too much time now because of the schedule and being behind slightly uh, with time already. Um, but we thank you very much for, for taking the time to join us uh, and to talk to us uh, through to the Swiss Pavilion. Um, so now then I would like to uh, say thank you to you. We are giving you a round of applause from here. Thank you. So um, up next, we have another speaker also uh, joining us Pleasure. Thank online. You. Thank you. Also joining us online, uh, Professor Jakob Zinstag uh, from the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. And he'll be talking, us today, talking to us today about One Health for Sustainable Development Goals. So thank you for joining us. You may feel free to share your slides and you can start talking now. I hand over the floor to you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? So we hear you. Good. I will try to share my slides. Can you see my slides? Yes. Good. So, uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very pleased and privileged to talk to you today 
Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I cannot make it physically to Dubai, but it would be almost a little bit contradictory to speak about One Health climate change and the sustainable development goals and keep flying around the world like crazy. But um, uh, I'm very happy that the digitalization allows us uh, also a little bit, thanks to Corona, to have such conversations um, in a video format. So uh, today I would like to explain to you what One Health is, the theoretical foundations, and explain it at the example of uh, rabies. Rabies is an infectious disease that is mostly transmitted from biting animals, mostly dogs, to humans, and then explain to you also what is transdisciplinarity, Uh, both expressions, one health and transdisciplinary, uh, they are often uh, used in a con in a confusing way, and there is a lack of consensus what it really means. And uh, I argue today that we have a clear theory for both, and uh, we would like to convey this to you. But we would not like to stay with theories and definitions. We would like to give you examples how uh, integrated approaches like One Health can mitigate effects of climate change, but also address sustainable development goals. And we would like to explain this to you at the example of integrated environmental animal and human disease surveillance response systems. So... All what I tell to you uh, to you today is uh, also written down in this book, the second edition of our uh, uh, book on One Health, the theory and practice of integrated health approaches, uh, edited by Kabi. Uh, very newly, we have also a One Health platform at Kabi that is consisting of an electronic journal, a case study, database and also um, knowledge base. And uh, I'm the editor in chief. And if you are interested to become editors or to become contributors, you can contact us, please. So if you don't, uh, if you forget everything what I tell you now, then I would argue, ask you um, uh, keep in mind what I tell you on this slide. This is the essential of uh, One Health. One Health has requirements, which means integrated approaches have requirements which are absolutely necessary, but they are not sufficient, which means we must recognize that humans and their health are inextricably linked to their environment, to their livestock, to their companion animals, to wildlife and all other environmental aspects. We cannot spend a second without breathing fresh air or drinking clean water. Uh, these are all ecosystem services that we need. So we are inextricably linked. And uh, it is absolutely critical that we understand these deep interconnections. We say, call this also get the biology right. But this is not sufficient yet for an integrated approach like One Health. As a sufficient criterion for One Health, we postulate to demonstrate an added value of health and well-being of humans and animals, or financial savings, or social resilience and environmental sustainability that we can reach from a closer cooperation of human and animal health and other sectors in environmental and social sciences. So in a nutshell, cooperation brings benefits, but we must prove it. That's one health. So I show this to you at one example about um, dog mass vaccination in an African city in Jamena, the capital city of Chad. So as I said at the beginning, dog rabies is mostly transmitted from biting dogs to humans. And um, fortunately in rabies, we have the special uh, possibility that people that are bitten by dogs 
their life can still be saved by early post-exposure prophylaxis, which means if you are bitten by a suspected dog, you quickly get vaccinated and then your life can be saved. Uh, now, you can argue what is more, uh, what is less costly? Should we just treat all the humans that are bitten by dogs or uh, should we vaccinate the dogs? Because at the end, the dog is the reservoir of the disease. And if we vaccinate 70% of the dogs, we can interrupt transmission and we can, we can uh, actually eliminate rabies. So uh, here you see a mass vaccination campaign that we did in Jamena Chard. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, where we vaccinated uh, each year 20,000 of the 35,000 dogs in uh, the capital city of Chad, which has about a 1.1 uh, million pop human population. So here is the answer. So if you treat uh, all the humans uh, who are being bitten all the time, uh, you have you can save their life, but you have increasing cost and these costs ever rise. They will never stop because you don't interrupt transmission. Whereas if you invest in dog mass vaccination and PEP, you have higher cost at the beginning. But once you have interrupted transmission, the incremental cost grow slower than if you treat only humans and you break even after about six years. So on a horizon of 10 years, it is definitely less costly to invest in dog mass vaccination than only investing in humans. So this is a key example of an added value of a systemic integrated approach to a health problem between humans and animals. So the second foundation, I mentioned at the beginning that we benefit from cooperation. Now, this cooperation, what does it mean exactly? It does not, it means essentially that we work between different academic disciplines. This is what we call interdisciplinarity. But it means also that we work between science and society that we engage with non-academic actors and tap into the practical knowledge of communities, of authorities, of NGOs, of any stakeholder that can contribute to the problem solving. So we value all contributions from all stakeholders in the research process to generate transformational knowledge uh, to uh, solve societal problems. How? And I, I think there is an emerging career profile. Uh, at least we train people in that respect that they are not only able to work in an interdisciplinary way, but they are also socially competent to work between science and society. How does this look like in practice? On the left side, you see an example from 2005 where we bring together uh, uh, communities, uh, authorities and scientists on the shore of Lake Chad, here on the left side. And here on the right side, this is 100 kilometers north of Timbuktu in North Mali. In each case, we bring together decision makers, we bring the concerned population and we bring the scientists together. And in the, it is in these kind of platforms that we can generate transformational knowledge to adapt uh, treat, uh, treatment or control strategies to the local context. You see here the website of the uh, uh, transdisciplinary network of the Swiss academies. Switzerland is globally leading in transdisciplinary research. And on this website, you see, find also a toolbox uh, on how to do these kind of processes. They are not trivial. If you are not yourself a social scientist, I recommend you to associate a social scientist in such processes because there are many pitfalls, but there is also a high potential for societal problem solving to do this. So 
We don't want to stop with this theoretical consideration. We believe there is a high potential of integrated approach, uh, approaches to address issues of climate change and sustainable development goals. And we show this at one example. We have not much more time. Uh, this is a, not a new idea. It was already published by the World Bank in 2012 in their volume, People, Pathogens and Our Planet, where they show that uh, if a newly emerging pathogen emerges in the environment, the associated cost to control it are relatively low. That's the red line. The red line represents the cumulative societal cost. If you wait until such a disease reaches uh, livestock or domestic animals, the cost rise already. And if you wait until you have human clinical cases, the costs are even much higher. The COVID-19 pandemic is a wonderful, sorry, in quotes, example of the the co correctness of this assumption by the World Bank, which was already stated in 2012. So it makes a lot of sense if we bring together disease surveillance and response systems at the environmental level, the domestic animal level and the public health level. But the reality is that in most countries of the world, Surveillance response systems are still separated between humans and animals. The new SARMA systems of the Helmholtz Institute includes also the animal section more and more, which is a very good example. And uh, another good example is the uh, West Nile virus surveillance in Emilia Romagna in northern Italy, where uh, mosquitoes, wild birds, Horses and humans are included in the surveillance and there is communication between all these sectors. And uh, th this uh, West Nile, integrated West Nile virus surveillance and response system uh, has already demonstrated financial savings. This is the paper by Julia Paternoster. But this applies to many other emerging diseases like uh, Vesna, actually Rift Valley or MERS or Q fever or uh, unknown new pandemics in the future. But that's not all. We need more than that. Already in 2005, we mentioned in a, uh, in a Lancet paper that uh, with regard to avian influenza then, th th then we had the pandemic of avian influenza that research on vaccines should urgently be complemented by a better management of smallholder livestock systems and live animal markets to prevent interactions, uh, un uh, uh, bio unsafe interactions between wildlife, livestock and humans which might be reservoirs for future pandemics. We said that already in 2005 and nobody was listening. And now we have the next pandemic and we may also have future pandemics. So we urgently need to better control biosecurity at the production level, at the transport level and at the marketing level. At these intersections is the major risk of future pandemics. And this could be prevented if we have a better One Health governance. And at the moment, the one, the, the health governance is on one side at the human health uh, by the international health regulations and at the World Organization of Animal Health with the PDS system, the performance of veterinary services systems. These systems are currently separated and our, our, our vision is to bring them closer together under a One Health governance. If we have a better One Health governance, we could actually cross inform each other on in emerging diseases and uh, ha reduce the risk and also the cost of future pandemics. If we operationalize this to a maximum level, then we could probably not totally prevent, 
but uh, massively reduce the future cost of future pandemics. This is the vision of uh, One Health's integrated approach to emerging diseases in relation uh, also to climate change with increasing um, vector-borne diseases. And I show this to you at an example of the Chichiga University One Health Initiative in Ethiopia, where we are building up such an integrated human and animal disease surveillance system here in the Somali region of Ethiopia. And we lead these transdisciplinary processes here with a women's group, which contribute massively to mitigate also uh, the disease outbreaks by uh, community-based health insurances. This is just to show you a practical example how we can apply integrated surveillance response also in low-income countries. This is funded by the Swiss uh, Development uh, and Cooperation Agency, SDC. So altogether, we can conclude that uh, such integrated approaches would actually touch almost all the SDGs, uh, which I don't detail for time reasons here, but I would really like to conclude that uh, integrated approaches like One Health have an important role to play in the mitigation of health effects of climate change, pandemic prevention, and reaching the sustainable development goals. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. I'm not sure if you could hear us, uh, but if you could not hear us, then we were giving you a round of applause and a very, very heart heartfelt thank you from our side for sharing your knowledge and your expertise, uh, very expertise and, and uh and your perspective, obviously, from a from a Swiss perspective, from an expert in the field applied to a consideration for One Health and what this means for COVID-19 and other, uh, other health challenges. So thank you very, very much. Uh, we do have some time for questions. Um, so it is now time for me to open the floor to those who do have uh, any questions or comments to your talk. Do we have any questions from our audience? Yes, we do. Uh, we're handing a microphone over to somebody in the audience who would like to address you. Excellent presentation, Jacob. Uh, and I appreciate the concept. My question is, I, I'm Professor Y.K. Gupta from India. My question is, in India, <coughs> the dogs, rabies, the rabies induced death, is a problem. A lot of NGOs are working on that dogs should not be killed, their rights. So all the animal activists are very strong, particularly in cities. However, the vaccination of dogs was suggested once and was rejected by, or I would say it was not accepted as a policy by different organizations because of the cost and the practical practicality. You very rightly said that this needs to be an involvement of integrated society, public and the policy makers. In India, what do you suggest where there is a no epidemiological data counting system that how many dogs we have in village, in, in the streets? And every time it multiplies uh, or increases, the only data which we get at yearly how many deaths because of rabies. So what do you suggest? Thank you very much for this question. And I hope that this question would come. Um, I can tell you two things. Um, I know that Goa, the state of Goa in India, is about to eliminate uh, dog transmitted rabies by mass vaccination of dogs. So you have the first example in India of a state that can eliminate uh, rabies. Economically, it is very clear. And you, you should know that I am trained by Indian economists. <laughs> For example, Pradeep Iti, who is a livestock economist. So I can tell you, India would save a lot of money 
if it immediately invests in dog mass vaccination. On the horizon of 10 years, India, the Indian society, saves money by investment in dog mass vaccination. And if India keeps just investing in human post-exposure, uh, this is a tragedy of the commons. Uh, so uh, the, the, there is the, the, my conclusion is uh, outright. India saves a lot of money if it invests immediately in dog mass vaccination. I endorse and I will try to... I fully endorse and I will try to to campaign this. Maybe I, I will... I can take, help you. I can yeah, help that's you. why I was saying I, maybe I will get in touch with you how to take it forward, how to convince Please. our policy makers at the state level. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. We also have another question at the back. Hello, Jakob. Nino is speaking. It's great to have you here in the Swiss Pavilion in Dubai. And um, it's fantastic. You have already connected with the Indian colleagues, with Professor Gupta. I think we can follow up on that. I can give you the email of, of Jakob, of course. He's an expert in the field since decades. Yeah, Jakob, I have a question. Um, we have now these uh, great examples you made, how to move into the future. Could you elaborate, given that we sit in the Swiss pavilion? It is um, strange. I mean, Switzerland had rabies and uh, we got rid of it. Did we approach it in the way that you now are advocating to do in the transdisciplinary approach at that time? Or did we do it differently? And if so, why? Or how? Uh, I, yeah, I, I, thank you, Nino. And uh, I'm sorry I, I'm not in Dubai. I would have loved to come, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I have to, too much pressure in Switzerland to be, be uh, come to Dubai. So, uh, Switzerland um, actually was pioneering uh, rabies elimination in Europe. Um, you should distinguish two cycles. In the world, we have two major cycles of rabies. We have the dog rabies cycle, which is prevailing in the southern, hem uh, in the southern hemisphere, uh, with India as a hotspot. India has 90% of uh, human dog-mediated rabies. But in the temperate areas, it is wildlife. And in Europe, it is the red fox. The red fox is the reservoir of rabies in Europe. And Professor Steck, my late professor of virology, developed an oral bait vaccine. He took chicken head and put the vaccine in the chicken head. And then they worked with the hunters. So they worked intuitively already in a tree transdisciplinary way, they use the practical knowledge of the hunters to find where the foxes are in the forest. So they, this is not academic knowledge, this is practical knowledge. And uh, the hunters help to distribute it, the fox baits. And in this way, uh, uh, rabies could be eliminated in Switzerland. But now I say something very important. Rabies is a transboundary disease. No country can free itself without regional cooperation. So fortunately, the European neighbors, France, Germany, Italy, Austria, and other countries took over the oral bait vaccination and they produced industrial baits that could be released with airplanes. So air, air, airplane distribution of baits helped actually to eliminate rabies. And Switzerland would not have been able to free itself from a rabies alone. It was only because of the uh, spatio-temporal coordination with Germany, France, Italy, and Austria that it was possible to eliminate it. So, and I would also say this to India. In India, you need a regional interstate cooperation to have a coordinated approach to eliminate rabies. And I would work against the geographical barriers. That's also what we did in Switzerland. We vaccinated the mountain valleys and then we had the geographical barriers of the Alps behind us from where it could not come back. In India, you have the sea or you have the Himalayas. This would be the starting uh, points for an uh, elimination campaign. We plan this in a similar way for Africa. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think I can speak on behalf of all of us when I say that we were very immersed and engaged in your session thanks to the to your clear passion and expertise in the subject. So thank you very much and we give you a round of applause from here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So uh, then that means for all of us, those joining online and those here live, um, we have a break now. Uh, so please, uh, if you're at home, grab a warm cup of coffee. And if you're here, then please join us outside on the rooftop for something cold. <laughs> so it's very much dependent on the weather. Um, thank you again for tuning in. Please don't uh, leave us. Please stay with us for the remainder of our of our session. We have three more experts coming from uh, Switzerland who will be talking to us again about public health uh, and uh, particularly beyond the pandemic. Uh, so thank you very much and I invite you to join us on the rooftop or <laughs> virtually at the break. Thank you.
So uh, welcome back. Thank you for uh, joining us once again. Yeah. Hopefully you are connected to us online or you are here live with us. I uh, hope you could enjoy a nice coffee break. I don't want to make anyone too jealous, but we did enjoy coffee in the sunshine on the rooftop of the Swiss Pavilion. Very, very nice. Um, so uh, yes, welcome back to the second part of this session. As I said, we have uh, three experts from Switzerland who will be talking to us about uh, public health beyond the pandemic, so leading on from uh, what we heard about in the session earlier, uh, beginning with uh, an opening. The first speaker uh, is Professor Milo Puhan, who is the Director of the Epidemiology, Biostatistics and Prevention Institute at the University of Zurich. He will be talking to us uh, today about public health research on COVID-19 in Switzerland. Thank you very much. I hand the word over to you, Milo. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Very happy to contribute. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm, 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 I'm telling a little bit our journey. We have been uh, go, gone through the last almost two years, kind of the public health research response of the Swiss School of Public Health on COVID-19 in Switzerland. And I think at the core of this effort is really trying to understand what the pandemic means, <clears throat> in this case for a country like, um, like Switzerland. And you all know these numbers, um, the daily number of cases, but it's often really quite difficult to make sense out of these numbers. You see here now, of course, your attention probably goes to the right side to this, to this surge in cases that we also have in Switzerland. We have very, very high um, case numbers right now, but they're in much lower in, in other parts um, of the world and also Europe. Um, but what is really behind these numbers? They do not tell us the whole story. Um, so there is a whole bunch of reasons why the numbers are so different across the countries. It has to do with testing capacity and many other, many other issues. And what we really tried to do is early on tackle this this challenge and see um, and trying to figure to understand what is the true spread of the virus in Switzerland and what is the impact of the pandemic more broadly. Because as public health researchers, of course, we look beyond the virus, we look beyond the, the infection, and there is so many implications of this pandemic, and you, sh you see just a few of them here. For example, the impact on, 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 the, on the kids going to school, you see this incredible number of 1.6 billion um, 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 uh, kids who didn't go to school, at least at some point um, and during the pandemic. You, you saw implications like less spending on the, on the clean energy transition, increase in poverty. There is a mental health, um, mental health crisis actually going on um, that we have a hard time to respond to. And there is other implications like on, 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 on the whole culture, the cultural um, and music, arts and so on, which is just a very important part um, of our lives and is something that really keeps us um, 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 together. So these are just a few implications um, of the pandemic uh, where it becomes very clear that this goes well, well beyond just some case numbers, some, some, some infections. And what we did, we, we, we came together very quickly, basically in March 2020, um, as the Swiss School, and you see the, the, the locations of the sites that very quickly joins this effort to do research together. What we also observed is that uh, also in other countries, we learned from other countries that there are many efforts, but many of these efforts are not really coordinated, not even within the same country. And what we tried to do is to get a consistent picture of the pandemic in Switzerland. And this is why we had these 14 universities or health organizations who came together. By now we have more than 50 or actually more than 60,000 study participants in, 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 in more than 40 studies um, across Switzerland. And what we did, we really embarked on new ways to run such studies. One example is that we really tried to get um, public-private funding for this whole research because we thought uh, um, it's, it's better to have both sides contributing actually than also involving public and private funding sources. We also had a um, the umbrella organization of the Swiss School of Public Health that provided really um, a core for coordinating the program and 
we also had an external company that we that we hired and coll collaborate since very closely who ran a lot of the of the of the legal communication parts financing parts of the program um that was really um, a very good joint venture coming together you know um we as health scientists and and and, and professionals in 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 these other areas of the management of such a large of, of such a large effort and we also, I will come back to that, invested quite a lot in getting to all the areas in Switzerland, you know, some places are quite remote, hard to access. So we had, for example, these buses to reach the, the farthest corner in Switzerland. And we also had quite an investment in public and science to public communication. I will give you a few examples of that um, later on. What we agreed on is that that we have um, a focus on, of course, first on the spread of the virus, understanding the spread of the virus in Switzerland. And you may know one of these curves that show you that uh, the virus, when one gets infected, um, the viral load gets higher and higher. One is infectious at some point, one may get symptoms at some point in time, but the, the testing numbers do not tell us the whole story because only, probably only those um, who, go, who have symptoms mostly go um, um, have regular have testing, so maybe around 50% of all people who have an infection go um, asymptomatic without any symptoms or with many, many with very mild symptoms. So we have many, many undetected infections. And so we talk about a, a ratio of the actual diagnosed cases to the true number of cases, and this ratio can be enormously different. In the beginning of the pandemic in Switzerland, it was like, 1 to 10, 1 to 15. In children, it was even 1 to 80, 1 to 90. Um, it differs across countries. Now it's much lower, but there are still countries where, where they, you do not have large testing capacity, but this ratio is very large. So what you do in this, in this situation is um, focus on the immune response um, of people. And this is what we used here. Um, we actually took um, uh, the proof, uh, the, 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 the immune response at the proof of infection. So I won't go into details here. It's too technical, but you can have um, certain cells that then, um, if they are trained to the virus, attack the virus if it comes again, or you can have the antibodies. And antibodies is something you can measure quite easily in the blood if you have a good test. And this is what we did as the core of our research program. So what we what we benefited a lot from is that Geneva was super quick in starting a so-called zero prevalence study. So determining the proportion of, of the population that has developed antibodies as a proof of infection. And what you see here is that the B panel, the, the lower um, figure, shows you the, da the, the daily um, uh, infections. And towards the end of the pandemic, um, Geneva started to do at regular intervals every week, they invited between 200, 400 people to do testing, antibody testing. Um, these pay people were already enrolled in a study, so it was quite convenient to do that quickly. And you see that they did that repeatedly and and, and, and we could see how this zero prevalent prevalence increases. And after the first wave, the zero prevalence was already up to close to 10% in the canton of Geneva. It was much, much lower in other cantons, but Geneva was quite heavily affected. So this was the first um, investigation into the spread of the virus. And we took um, this protocol, further developed it, and had the idea really to have to, to look at corona immunity across Switzerland and, and, and do all kinds of other research really to inform also the public and the decision makers um, to, um, to, to have um, some databases and, 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 and for, for decisions that have, to be, that have to be made. So what we, what we did in this research program, uh, we, we agreed on a core protocol that everybody did the same at the site. So invited people um, from the general population, they can come to a center or to one of the buses, have their blood drawn, Filled in a number of questionnaires, not only at, at the beginning, but over time. And then we had the, 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 the antibody tests and notified participants about that. So we standardized that um, across the country, which is quite unique. There are not many countries that had a kind of a standardized protocol for this research across an entire country. And what is very important to mention is that each side had the liberty um, to, to conduct additional studies. Um, they acquired, they found additional funding 
for example, Ticino had a focus on the elderly and in nursing homes. And as you as you know, this is one that the most vulnerable population in this pandemic and nursing home are really challenging, challenging location to 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 manage um, somehow this um, the, the pandemic. So they had this, a strong focus on that. Basel, um, the Swiss Tropical Public Health Institute had a, a initiated a very large digital cohort of, of, of more than 10,000 um, people with a, with a focus on well-being and mental health. As you know, mental health is a very important issue in this, in this pandemic. And we, for example, in Zurich had a number of cohort studies um, set up, for example, in school kids, 2,500 school kids and parents and teachers that we follow over time to see how the, how the, how the virus spreads in schools, but also look at the physical and mental health of children during the, during the pandemic. So you see, this was quite an, a good model for, for doing research in a country. We had a court protocol where everybody contributed to, but we left a lot of freedom to decide to conduct additional additional studies just um uh, uh, in addition what, what we also did so we had a so-called digital follow-up so we asked participants at the beginning actually almost every week and then we we went to larger intervals but you see the diversity of topics that we addressed of course, we focused on, 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 on issues related to the virus, new infections or adherence to preventive measures. But we also ask about what is the perception of the health or economic, societal risks during the pandemic, mental health, feeling of loneliness. We also looked at the Swiss COVID app, a contact tracing app. And we also um, looked quite in detail into the vaccination or vaccine hesitancy and how the vaccine rollout worked out in, in Switzerland. Again, with the, with the primary aid to inform the health authorities and the public about what was going on in Switzerland. I give you just a few results of that to give you a flavor. So these are the the the, um, the, the data on, on on protective measures like mask wearing, they required or social distancing in two different age categories like 20 to 64 year old, 65 plus, and we aggregated the results from different cantons to the regions, Ticino, southern Italian-speaking part of Switzerland, Romandy, the, the western um, French-speaking part, and the German-speaking um, uh, cantons. And what we saw there is really to how, how people adhere to the mask and to the social distancing over time. So we see quite some changes over time, also in relation to the, to the, to the, to the current situation. So this was quite a good tool to, to, to feel like the pulse of the population, how they adhere and how they comply with the measures um, that were put in, in place. Another example was, again, um, the, the vaccinations. So we could monitor how vaccinations were picked up by different age groups, people with chronic disease or with, with all kinds of, um, of, of features to really understand who is, who is picking up the vaccine, who doesn't. And I think this was, um, and we put this together, a report every month, we put together a report for the Federal Office of Public Health so that they got some numbers about the vaccination campaign and to inform their own strategies to reach um, or to, to, to reach as many people in Switzerland as possible. But let's go now back to the core of the, of, of the study, which was again monitoring the spread of the virus over time. Um, you see here the, the, the data from the 20 to 64 year olds. Uh, on the left bottom, you see where the cantons were after the first wave. I talked about Geneva, which was at around 10%. You see also our region, Zurich, was at 3%, 3 so much lower. So we, we saw quite substantial variation across the cantons. Half a year later, it already increased. Um, we had a pretty large wave in the fall of, 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 of 2020. So it increased the zero prevalence quite a bit. And then you see in the mid of 2021, the effect of the vaccinations. So not, not everybody got it who wanted it up to that point, but you already see it a quite a strong effect of the vaccination. So the antibodies reflect infection, but also vaccinations. And you see where we were at the end of 2021, we were like at, at about 90%, even in, the, in, the, in, in, in this middle age group. It looks even more, and well, what is important to, to mention here is that we have the official case number, we have the antibody results, and from that we can determine actually how many more are infected than were actually diagnosed. So, for example, we, we saw overall we see a, a ratio of about one to three, but again, this ratio um, varied quite a bit. At the beginning, there was not enough testing capacity, it was around one to ten. Currently, in the mid of the Omicron wave, Testing capacity really has come to a limit as well. So this number is probably higher, again, than, one, than the one to three. 
but it gives you an idea. So if you see that, for example, 2 million were infected in Switzerland, it's actually more like 5 to 6 million who got the infection at some point in time. Let's look at the 65 plus. You, uh, the zero prevalence was, um, was lower at the beginning, which is good because um, um, there was also um, special attention to protecting this age group. Then it also increased with the second wave, but then it really rose very, very quickly thanks to the vaccination. So the 65 plus age groups were, were, were of course, prioritized for vaccinations. And you see a very high zero prevalence that is also nowadays um, probably around 95% in this in this age group. So you see it, it's a tool to monitor this, um, how the immunity rose in the, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the population according to age, according to, the, to different geographic areas and to other characteristics. What is, um, what, is, what is maybe puzzling <laughs> is that we, a lot, there was a lot of talk about so-called herd immunity, you know, if the zero prevalence is 80 or 90 percent, the population is protected. And we see now in the Omicron wave that many, many, although um, uh, infected before or vaccinated, still get the Omicron infection. Why is that? So the reason for that is that we have, uh, I don't want to make it too complicated, but here, what do you see then? The, 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 the coronavirus with these characteristic spikes, and there is a particular area where, the, where, where this virus binds to the human cells. And this goes through this receptor binding domain, and there is on the, on, on the side of the cells, there is certain receptors like this ACE2 receptor where it binds. If you develop now antibodies, you have two different types of antibodies. Some bind exactly to this receptor binding domain. The more of those you have, the better protected you are from a new infection and in particular from a severe course of the disease. Whereas there is a whole bunch of other antibodies that's, that, that bind anywhere in this, on the spike or anywhere on the virus that do not really help much um, with, with immunity. And now what we also do in this Swiss-wide um, um, research program, we also monitor on a population base, and I think this is quite special, thanks to a high throughput test, we monitor also to um, how many have neutralizing activity. So meaning that we have these antibodies who bind exactly to the location where the virus binds to the human cell. And what we saw is that this binding capacity is very high for those who got vaccinated, but it decreases over time. And those who didn't get the vaccine really have much, much lower of this binding capacity. But again, it loses this binding capacity a little bit over time because the antibodies go, go down. And what we know by now is that even if you have antibodies, it does not really necessarily protect you from a new infection, but it protects you very well from a severe COVID-19 um, um, course. So, what has become clear is um, that we do not need to look only at this zero prevalence, but we also need to understand how many have this neutralizing capacity in the population and how persistent is that over time. So what we're going to do now in round five in March, which is after this large Omicron wave, you see my projection for the zero prevalence. I expect, so I expect a very high zero prevalence, but again, this doesn't tell us the whole story, but what we also going to look at is how many have neutralizing capacity and how well does the, the level of the antibodies as, is, is correlated with new infections and severe courses of COVID-19. So we see we continuously had to adapt the protocols and the questions that arose, but I think thanks to flexible um, um, setup of Corona Munitas, we were able to address, to address questions as they came um, along. Just two things about our communication. So we had um, a lot of, we tried to do as much communication and as quickly as possible, like to the, on the federal level, to the, to the Swiss Federation, to the COVID the science task force in each of our cantons, but also international level. We also prioritize this communication over scientific um, publications because they often take time. So we try to inform the authorities um, as quickly as possible. Just this morning, we informed the, the authorities about results from our kids study, Chao Corona, in, in the school children before we, we put out the results and public or, or on any papers just to timely inform the decision makers. On the other side, we, we, we invested a lot in science to public communication. And for example, by this YouTube channel, um, Science in a Minute, where we explain in one minute certain concepts um, or results of, of the studies. So we have more than 40, 40, 40 of these one minute videos on our YouTube channel 
uh, that, that are in, in, in French, Italian or, or German. So this is really made for the public. And we also have around specific studies like this Child Corona School study, we have a specific dedicated website to, to have the communication to parents and children um, as good as, um, as possible. So overall, I think the pandemic also for, for us researchers offered many opportunities. I think it's the first time ever worldwide that, that, that the virus has been is being studied so comprehensively from so many perspectives. It really brings together disciplines. So this is not just a domain of virologists and epidemiologists by no means. So we need we need many, many disciplines to really understand um, the, what is going on and what the implications of this pandemic are. And I think Corona Immunitas is also, was also great or is, is still great to strengthen research collaboration across Switzerland. And, and I guess it's gonna be a very good basis for, for more research to come in the future in Switzerland and beyond. With that, I stop here since we still so that we still have some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully you could hear us giving you a round of applause <laughs> from here. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this very insightful talk into uh, the latest on the public health research on COVID-19 in Switzerland. Uh, for those of you who are here live, um, Co Corona Munitas is a um, a very important feature, actually, of um, what SSPH Plus has been showcasing here at the Swiss Pavilion. So if you go down to the exhibition room of the Swiss Pavilion, so that's the ground floor, uh, you will see that Corona Munitas is featured very strongly there in a wonderful innovation fountain. For those of you who are uh, joining online, you can find out more about Corona Munitas uh, on their website and also on the SSPH Plus at Expo website to find out how exactly Corona Munitas has been featured here at the Expo in Dubai at the Swiss Pavilion. Um, so uh, thank you once again, and I'd like to, to open up this time of taking questions and any comments and feedback that may be coming from our live audience or those online. So. All right, I have a question already here at the very front. Professor Pohan, thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation. I just have a question on the logistical and practical side of setting up such an organization uh, suddenly because Corona struck us all by surprise. How was it to implement this uh, under such short notice and more specifically to implement this with different bodies, different bodies of government, but also different bodies uh, of different specialities all together under one roof? If you can share us a few <laughs> insights, that would be really good. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And yeah, I, th I think the key factor was that all our colleagues at the different universities and health organizations just had a great motivation to collaborate to do this together. I think this was at the end, it was really a very hands-on pragmatic um, attitudes and willingness to collaborate and not thinking about publications first. So I think this was absolutely key. Then the other key thing was that we had Swiss School of Public Health in place. We knew each other. Um, uh, this helped a lot. So the organization, the logistics could go through the through the Swiss School uh, as well. I mentioned that before that we hired um, an external company, um, and that helped tremendously to deal with financial, legal issues, communication issues, and so on. So and uh, study management. So that helped a lot. I think it's all these pieces that came together. Um, that made it possible to get up to speed so quickly. What we also did just recently, and maybe, and we will make that public soon, we, we put together um, a white book, so to speak, about the experience of this. Um, uh, of course, some mistakes happen, as always. And we put together a white book with the learnings um, of this so that we can also uh, learn to do it even um, better next time. Thank you. We have another question. Um, Milo, Nino is speaking. It's wonderful that you are also here in the Swiss Pavilion. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to add one point and then ask actually a question to introduce and, and have an opinion from an Iranian colleague who is here. Um, in the last comment, Milo forgot to say one thing. Of course, having the Swiss School of Public Health was absolutely instrumental to start, but it's about single people. And I mean, Milo, he is also the president of the Swiss School of Public Health Foundation. We are a foundation. 
And I mean, he's one of those enthusiasts in our large faculty all across Switzerland who has completely understood that we have to work together. And I just want to emphasize that because, of course, people are individuals, and um, I mean, many others would not do the same. So he had the vision to not just do it on his own, which he could have done as a University of Zurich uh, project, yeah? And that was really absolutely instrumental, and I'm very grateful, Milo, that uh, you did that, and it's a huge success. So um, talking now about actually, uh, about exactly this point. So we are very proud that we did that. But it's also true we did that because there was a complete lack of anything like, like a system that would collect data anyway in Switzerland. And that is our weakness. And we know very well some countries, they have established systems where if the pandemic comes, they are ready to measure X, Y, and Z and everything. So I wonder, um, you... Um, Dr. Nazim Gini Forush is here from Iran. Did Iran have to establish new systems to deal with this epidemic in that sense as well? Or were you just ready to go and implement kind of existing survey systems and, and whatever? I, I really wonder how that situation is in Iran. Uh, thank you very much. Um, actually, uh, as I got it, correctly, uh, you want to know that uh, that we have a system in Iran that can face the pandemic condition uh, and manage it. Uh, no, no. We just, uh, as the previous uh, lecturer said, um, the uh, problem is that the politicians and uh, uh, who the, person, the people who can decide uh, have some impacts on the result. For example, uh, in some strange condition in Iran, um, we have a lower number of contaminants, but uh, when we face some economical condition, the number of the uh, actually uh, patients will improve. It's fantastic, I don't know. Uh, the number of the government said is a little bit different with what we see inside the society. And uh, according to the number, we, they decide to uh, lock down or not. But uh, there is no uh, actually um, uh, there is no decision regarding how to face the pandemic. As we see, maybe in future uh, we have these decisions because uh, this is unusual. You know, uh, in 2019 we faced this. Uh, to, uh, 2020 we faced this, and it's uh, uh, actually terrible for us. Uh, but from now on, we we have this mission. Yeah. In future, we have these kinds of pandemic condition, another virus another condition. So it's better to decide how to deal with it right now um, uh, rather than thinking about it in the future, I think. So, um, Nazim, that, that is the learning experience for all of us. I wonder, Milo, I mean, you know uh, the world of doing such research. Uh, do you have examples where you know they did not have to start from scratch like we had to, where they were just ready, and what conditions would you need to just be ready? Mm. Yeah, I would say the, the countries, at least I, I'm aware of that, where had really a lot of things in place to get started very quickly, is the, um, South Africa, um, Israel, UK, Spain. So these are the countries that come to my mind because they just have, on one side, they don't have these data silos as we often have. So they have um, they have already kind of a data capturing system uh, that they can observe also real time things in the healthcare and by, um, uh, setting or, or, or public health. So I think these countries were um, quicker and, and I, I guess they have a more sustainable approach um, to do this. I mean, it's nice. I think it's quite efficient how we did it, but in another way, it's also highly inefficient because we built it up from scratch. But the, the countries I mentioned, I think, just have a much better connected in, uh, infrastructure in terms of not only IT, but also human workforce to quickly jump on these things. Thanks a lot. And thank you so much for your time and for sharing um, this afternoon with us. Um, 
in the interest of time, we now will uh, move on to the next speaker. But thank you once again from us live here from the Swiss Pavilion. Round of applause from us. Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you. And then with that, we move on to our next speaker who is joining us also online uh, from Switzerland. And it is Professor Arno Chiolero. Uh, who is an epidemiologist and board certified public health physician uh, from the Population Health Laboratory at the University of Freiburg, Switzerland, and also at the McGill University in Montreal, Canada. He will be talking to us about public health surveillance, uh, in particular lessons from the pandemic. Very interesting. I hand it over to you, Arno. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. So, uh, I'm pleased to be here online with you. I hope you will hear me well. And I'm very glad to be uh, with you today to speak about that. I think my presentations will be a nice, uh, in the, will be perfect in the continuation of so just what we have discussed because we have discussed about surveillance systems and this is exactly what I will speak about. Let me just copy for you. I will share my presentation. Um, Okay, I will try to again. I will change this time. Okay, do you hear better that way? Not really. It was working before, and now the way is better. Mm, slightly. Could you keep, perhaps, keep speaking? Is that good? That's better. It's okay that way, you're sure? Uh, or uh, because I got no other solutions, it was working before. I don't know exactly what's going on. Okay, but I will try to move about that. Um, okay, so uh, the, the aim of my talk is to speak about what have we learned from the pandemics. And uh, uh, the initial uh, names of my talk was lessons from the pandemics, but I will concentrate on mostly on one lesson, which is about uh, the issue of surveillance and the plan of my presentations will be as follow. I will shortly remember what is surveillance. Uh, I will address the issue that, of course, we need data to to do surveillance and to uh, uh, being informed about how we can handle uh, public health activities. And actually, I will also show you that we have more and more data. Actually, we may have too much data. But key is that data do not speak by themselves. And one lesson, and this is the thing on which I will end my presentation, is that we need to strengthen our surveillance systems. Well, if I start with just the short definitions of what is surveillance, I like to quote this uh, General Lee Jong Wong, who was the late WHO Director General, and in an address to uh, WHO show staff a decade ago, he said that to make people count, we first be able to be able to count people. And I think in a very short, uh, in one sentence, this is one way to understand what is surveillance, counting people, counting health settings, to be able to make them count for us, and to be able also to act to improve the situations of these people. More formally, what is the definition of public surveillance? We can say that the biggest surveillance is the ongoing and systematic collections, analysis, and interpretations of the data. This is one part. But what is key is that you have to integrate these data collections with the timely dissemination of this data to the people who need these informations for prevention or controlling disease and injury. My point here is that we are very strong, and I will come back to that on the first part. We have lots of data, sometimes not complete or with some low quality, but we have some data. But we are much more weaker on the part of the disseminations and how we can get this data to the people who need this data. Again, in the short term, the key uh, aspect of surveillance is to provide information useful for decisions and actions in public health. I know. Sometimes, and I think also that the, the COVID pandemic was a, a revelator of that, there is some confusion between what is surveillance and what is research. In many, many settings, it goes together, but I think it's worth to be clear about the, dis the distinctions between both. Because in some situations, as I showed here in the slides, 
you are using some data to provide some information. But when you are doing surveillance, you try to use as soon as possible this data for decisions and actions. And if I come back to the presentations of Professor Juan, you have seen that Corona Militas aim to have some information for decisions and actions. In the same time, you can use this data and information also for knowledge, to provide knowledge for research. But I think it's key to make a little bit separation. And we have seen in the pandemic of the COVID that we have lots of information directly from the researcher, which are in many, many cases not directly useful for decisions and actions. And it was important for uh, those who have to, to have to take decisions how they can end up these informations. Of course, we need data. We need data to, example, to assess the burden of COVID-19. We need data to design and evaluate public health policy, for example, what is the effect of lockdown and what is the impact on the health of the populations, what is the impact of this policy to prevent the spread of the COVID-19. We need data to assess that. And of course, we need this data to provide information useful for decisions. And we have more and more data. Well, on one side, we have data designed for surveys. We have survey, registry. Sometimes we are used to use this data. We know who to analyze this data, how to use the data. But there is new and big data. We have data increasingly easily and at a large scale from healthcare providers, we have medical administrative data, and we have many, many different types of data which are not related directly to health. For example, this is trace on internet and social media. And with the pandemics, there is there was a major interest to all these type of data, and I will give you some examples. And uh, the question is, are these data easy to use for surveillance and for making some decisions? Here I'll give you some examples about the data we have. You see here the daily new confirmed COVID-19 test tests per million people uh, in different three different countries. I've taken Canada, Switzerland, and United Arab Emirates. And as you can see, the burden of cases uh, is very different from one country to the others. Uh, and uh, with recent trend, as you can see, that uh, this big trend country in Canada, maybe a better situation in Switzerland, but it's changing rapidly, and uh, a better situation since a long time in the United Arab Emirates. We have discussed about that, how it is difficult to interpret the data, to have a real assessment of the burden of the, of the pandemic, but nevertheless, you can see these data, which are uh, very interesting. What is key is that these data are very easily available. Now, uh, you get, for example, this site, our working data, who is collecting data throughout the world. And rapidly, in the first months, uh, or the first weeks, I would say, from the pandemics, many, many countries provide data to these websites, which are easily available, easily for everybody to analyze this data. And as you can see, very interesting to know that. Other more recent data, which are impressive and which are easily available, it is the data from vaccinations. And uh, I've taken all for that because uh, there is also striking difference between countries. If you look, for example, see United Arab Emirates, which is, as far as I know, the country with the highest uh, share of the people which are vaccinated with COVID-19. You can see the numbers for Switzerland. Here are 70 persons, and we have some difficulty uh, until now to have a higher share of the populations to be vaccinated. And other countries like Pakistan, Russia, again, uh, rapidly in this pandemic, we had access to this data and we were able to analyze it. And I think this is one of the big uh, novelty also we have to this um, uh, pandemic. We also uh, more uh, original data, for example, which is devo more devoted to research. And I give you one example of what I've called uh, like a digital trace. Here, this is data from mobile phone. And you can see here, uh, this is a map of the France. And you can see here uh, 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 the, the movement of the people who have mobile phone with them. 
And uh, when you've got a red line, it means that there is lots of movement of the people with these regions with their phones. While here it was during the lockdown, during the first lockdown in France, where you can see directly the effect of the lockdown uh, on the ability of the people to move uh, uh, in their regions about that. And here, this is really new data, and we have to learn to analyze them and to use them for decisions or for analysis. One issue with that thing is that data, big or small, do not speak by themselves. We have to take care first with low data quality. And I think this is also one thing uh, I would say uh, decision maker, also the people have discovered during this pandemic. And that sometimes that data are not very high quality, but despite that, we have to take some decisions. And I like these trips where you can see it could be here the Ministry of Health on the left, and on the right, you've got the people who are uh, collecting data, uh, the scientists, or the people who are specialists in surveillance. And uh, the guys say we should use this data, but the guy says this is bad data. We have other data, say the Ministry of Health, and they say this is bad data. We just have to average them, and they will speak alone, it seems, according to this Ministry of Health. Of course, we see the problem with this data. Having data, sometimes big data, is not enough, and there is no automatic production of information, and we need to improve that mix. The other issue, uh, and I think something which, were, which is not new with the pandemics, but which has become very, uh, which has reached a scale like never with these pandemics, is that we have an infodemic of information. We have very much data and maybe too much information. And uh, I've drawn these figures to explain also a little bit how it works. Traditionally, what we have, we have some a given amount of data which are treated or handled by the public health service people or researcher and they make some reports and we take some decisions on that. But nowadays, what we've got, we've got researchers working on their own, which are not always related to surveillance goals. We've got the classical media, who are producing their own analysis with the data which are available, and also through social media. So you have multiple, we have a, an increase in the volume of data, but an increase also in the volumes of information producer. And in the end, we reach with infodemic and sometimes misinformation about it. I'll give you one example. These numbers, uh, just to, for this line, to be the researcher, they produce lots of information. And one estimates, this is very difficult to count that, but one estimates published in science in September 2029 that uh, uh, more than 5,000, uh, 500,000. Uh, scientific publications will have been published according to these estimates at the times of the lockdown. This is such a problem that uh, WHO have uh, proposed some uh, way to handle this infodemic, and you've got tips for navigating the infodemics, which you can see here uh, the importance of assessing the sources, going beyond the headlines, and how we can handle this. Uh, uh, this huge amount of information. Also tips to limit the spread of information because with social media, this is a new way also the way information is spreading in the populations, especially the issue of misinformation. And the WHO has made some recommendations on how you can limit the spread of misinformation by making some a check at every step when you spread the information about that. There is also research devoted to these topics, what we call infodemiology, which are more and more interested in that topic. More than data, and this is where I would like to come with these last slides, is that we need to strengthen the surveillance system. We just need more data, but we need to strengthen the surveillance data. And surveillance systems is this is the systems we go from data to information to decisions. Key is that you have to plan the whole process. And here you can see that you go from data generations to the analysis to the productions of information. You have to think about how you disseminate these information to reach decisions maker. What we have are my uh, 
uh, analyze of that is that we have collectively lots of resources, sometimes not enough, but nevertheless, we have more resources, I would say, here on the going from data generations to the information productions, but maybe we have to strengthen here and to give more resources to going from the information to the decisions making. And I think this is one of the lessons we have from this pandemics. And here, this is my last slides to have some keywords about that. What I've tried to show you today that if we want to do efficient surveillance, we need to go from the data to information useful for decisions. We have, of course, more and more big data, but key that they do not speak by themselves. We have an issue of low quality of this data. We have an issue of infodemic. Uh, we have need to go beyond the confusions between data, information, and knowledge for decisions. Huh? And uh, this is really a key aspect of surveillance. I think we need to strengthen our surveillance systems. We've mentioned this before in the discussion the issue of workforce, people expert in the domains, and uh, also the importance of not working in silos. I think this has just been more about that. This is one of the big issues we have in our surveillance systems. And key things also is that we need the systems, but also we need a broader culture of surveillance of both data scientists. Data scientists have to understand what are the needs of the decisions makers and uh, how they make decisions, uh, how they understand also the data. And decision makers also have to have a better understand of what is, data, what is data science and what is behind data science, what are the strengths and the limitations of the data uh, we are using for uh, surveys. I thank you for your interest and I'm open to uh, discussions or any questions about these topics. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for this very insightful talk. Um, and I, I don't hear you. Sorry. Do you, hear, do you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. It's Great. Perfect that I hear you. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very, very insightful talk. And uh, uh, it's been excellent. It's a privilege from our side, uh, as, as I should mention, that you're also uh, leading uh, the Corona Immunitas Research in Freiburg. So it's uh, been a privilege for us to have two front runners uh, when it comes to Corona Immunitas speak to us uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm sure people do have questions to you, uh, considering how relevant and how interesting this topic is for us today. Uh, and with that, I would like to open the, um, the floor up to those who have questions, be it online or be it live. Um, so um, I take any questions from our audience now. Yeah. OK, the microphone. Anno, thanks a lot. It's Nino speaking here. Hi, Nino. It's wonderful you are also here. And my very first question is a short one. I am I right that the Matterhorn is behind you? Yes. But you are not this there. Is a, this is the right one. This is this Matterhorn. Is, this is fake. I, I didn't say that at the first uh, at the first slides, but uh, I'm working part time in Valais, and uh, I think it was a nice picture to see. Also for our colleagues from Dubai, if they want to come in Switzerland. It's very Dubai. nice, but it's fake. It's not where you are sitting now. Uh, it's, uh, I'm sitting currently in Valais, so uh, I'm, uh, Good. I would say, uh, 20 minutes from this place about. Half an hour Excellent. From this place about. So, yeah. um, Anno, um, I have a question because we have, uh, we have actually one in the audience who is uh, very much into digital digital health issues. Um, you, you have explained to us that surveillance and research is not just the same, there is some overlap, but uh, you need to think through the needs for both separately. And my question is actually here in the floor, in the room, I wonder, um, could the digital world, the digital tools today kind of help merging the needs of the research and the surveillance, or is that always are these two paths that you have to follow? Please introduce yourself, and then I'm sure you will have some opinions on that, and Arno will respond. 
Yeah, okay. okay, thank you, Nino, for the, for the question. So my name is uh, Thomas. I'm an assistant professor in health innovation and technology here in Dubai, and uh, I'm particularly trained in Switzerland. And um, I mean, the answer is yes, and um, I will tackle that in my talk in a minute. So I think we have good examples of um, apps uh, that were used uh, through the pandemic, may that be in Switzerland, but also uh, here in the, in the UAE. So there are ways of uh, collecting data but um, what I believe has not necessarily been done is basically uh, circulating this data to uh, the right bodies and their organization. And um, so we have data about uh, contact tracing, for instance. We also saw uh, in the presentation earlier that uh, there was some data collected um, about the behavior of people, or at least the perceived behavior of people by means of surveys. But what is, um, I believe, missing at the moment is, is to really have a very strong objective uh, um, data collection and uh, this data being shared basically amongst uh, the different parties and uh, to have some sort of a notion of um, having a unified understanding of um, what this data is and what to do with this data. May not be from a clinical perspective in order to better understand uh, the population's needs, but also from a research perspective, because uh, so far what we use uh, is basically relatively scattered and uh, um, I would say collected uh, in a decentralized ways. And uh, we also talk about that at the beginning, saying that uh, there isn't any um, basically standardized and unified way of collecting this data in Switzerland, for instance. Um, and I think that's a bit of a missed opportunity because we have the tools uh, that are uh, um, basically used already. And um, I will basically stop stop here my, my thinking because I will, I will try to come up with um, an idea of using digital health technologies in order to better uh, prevent and, uh, and trace uh, the behavior and uh, also um, uh, the data from the, from the population. Thank you very much, Nina, for the question. Can I make a comment about that? Yes, please do. Yes, please. Uh, thank you uh, for these very interesting uh, comments about that. Uh, definitely, uh, for sure that uh, digital tools for the collections uh, is changing, has changed, and will change, and will improve also uh, many, many, many aspects about that. And you rightly um, mentioned that there will be the issue of collecting data, which is one aspect also, but the circulations of the information is problematic. I think one growing issue we have also, this is also about the rep representativeness of this data. And um, uh, I think we have two problems, even with classical tools of surveillance, when the, the participant rate is going down, and uh, I can give examples of Corona and Litas, where we have 15 to 30% of participant rate, but it's difficult to have more than that in these population-based studies. It's one of the limitations, and I think it's one of the growing limitations in the current era that the participant rate is decreasing to classical tools. But even with digital tools, sometimes it's not so easy to define the source population. And this is something we need to think better or how to handle this type of data. And I think this is one of the big things where we have to improve the way we analyze things and the way we address these types of, uh, of issues. But for sure, digitalization is a plus and will bring lots of things, lots of new data, and uh, will be probably also quite efficient to get all this data. Thank you. Perhaps we have time for one more question. Do we have any more questions in the audience? Um, perhaps um, you might be able to expand a little bit on, um, in terms of uh, public health surveillance, uh, comparing the state of how things are in Switzerland to a global, uh, to a global perspective. What can you can, what can you say to us from Switzerland? What can we learn from Switzerland? Or how can we learn? Yeah. Do you mean you want me to discuss about the case in Switzerland or yes. worldwide? Um, well, perhaps a comparative perspective from Switzerland. Comparative perspective, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Alors, uh, perhaps to start with perhaps Switzerland, uh, I will use the term that uh, Professor Puan has just said before, the issue of silos. For, for sure, Switzerland is working in, in silos. Uh, there was silos between research and applied public health, and uh, 
uh, it is changing a little bit. Uh, uh, most, uh, I would say, uh, Swiss school of is exchanging is a, is a game changer in that domain. This is fantastic because we try to bring in the Swiss school of public health, the people from academic and applied public health. And this is very needed. We need to build that, but there is room for that thing. This is a case for Switzerland. Worldwide, I think that in many, many, many settings, people agree that we need to improve our surveillance systems. Uh, for sure that in some countries with very low resources, even the access to the data uh, is difficult. This is not only a question of systems, but even a question of resources for uh, data collections. But nevertheless, this is also where uh, digital tools can change the game. Uh, even in relatively low resource settings, it becomes possible to do some surveillance with, for example, uh, mobile phone throughout the world. I can give you examples, for example, following some uh, uh, dramatic moments uh, uh, in some area where they had some uh, uh, environmental disasters. Following this period of times, relatively rapidly, they could set up a system of surveillance of infectious disease using mobile phone, for example. And this is one of the big game changer about that. This is how I could do that. Making a general, let's say that, uh, statements on the state of the surveillance worldwide is difficult. I think. One of the key actors in that field is WHO, but I think to try to do the best, uh, I would not do, I would not make further comment on that, but for sure that uh, it puts surveillance at a core activity of the public health and, and call the country to strengthen the systems, though they are aware that they have to do that things further. The WHO, for example, has made a very great work uh, in the field of uh, the preventions of uh, uh, misinformations and handling of infodemic, as I've shown, and they are trying to address this issue about that. Thank you very, very much. And um, we've had a great time listening to you and hearing from your uh, perspective and your research. So thank you so much for sharing. And um, in the interest of time, we will move on to the next speaker and we take this opportunity to thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Beautiful uh, time. And goodbye. Bye. So um, up next is our final uh, speaker uh, before we head into a break. Um, we actually have two speakers who will be uh, coming up. Um, one is uh, online. It's Professor Oscar Franco. He's a professor of epidemiology and public health based at the Institute of Social and Preventative Medicine at the University of Bern. And he's also an adjunct professor at the Chan School of Public Health at the Harvard University. Uh, so we have the priv privilege to invite him to, to talk to us from online uh, in Switzerland, live streamed to us here at Swiss Pavilion. Um, and he will also then be joined by Thomas Boya, who is um, also assistant uh, professor in healthcare and innovation technologies at the College of Medicine, Mohammed bin Rashid University of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, together they will be uh, discussing a topic on prevention and digitalization what is the future? So to start with, uh, I invite you, Oscar, to, to, to talk to us online. Thank, Thank you, Emily, you. and good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry that I'm not able to join you in Dubai, and I really mean it. Uh, I wish I was there with you. And I say hello uh, from Bern. Uh, and Nino, this is not where I am. I'm not sitting here in front of this beautiful landscape, as you can see. Uh, but more than to share with you how Bern looks like, and uh, I hope to welcome you sometime in Bern. We have a large task ahead. We have a huge challenge. The Sustainable Development Goals has set up the agenda for the future. And what can we expect? What ca how can we reach these goals, and can we actually reach them? And what is the way forward? And I would like to start my presentation with my last slide or with my conclusions. And the conclusions is that the only way that we are going to be able to reach the sustainable development goals, which, which, which we need urgently all over the world, the only way is through prevention. Because prevention is the key factor for the future of healthcare. We talk a lot about personalized medicine, precision care. We talk about creating peace that are suitable for just one person. But can we actually continue living a life in which 
we focus on treating and curing instead of preventing and avoiding people from developing diseases, trying to maintain health? I don't think so. And in that sense, I think that prevention is also the fundamental pillar for personalized or precision care, because prevention will allow us to have the means, the resources, and to lower the need of healthcare access and services. Therefore, uh, I would like to continue talking about then if prevention is the future, how are we gonna get to the future? And quite often when we talk about the future, these days we talk about artificial intelligence. But are we talking too much about artificial intelligence for getting our natural intelligence? And what about digitalization? We talk about innovation, digitization, digital transformation, digitalization. All these trends have been invading us. Like this is a goal, but is digitalization a goal? Is that a destiny? Is that actually a transformation? Is an evolution of human beings? Or is it more a path, a tool, a road to dissemination? And one question that we all have, what is gonna happen in the future? Are we all going to become um, like this? I don't have an answer yet, but before we jump too much ahead into the future, I would like to go back to the present. What is the current situation? Currently, in this moment, we think we live in a very bad year or a very, very bad time because of the pandemic, the issues, the threats of global conflict, issues with the economy, etc. Nevertheless, if we look at the current situation, humankind has been achieving increases in life expectancy gradually throughout time. And right now, we are continuing to increase the life expectancy. That means that every time there is more of us that live longer, more of us that live to a healthier path throughout our lives. This has had an impact also in the amount of people we have around the world, and especially among the amount of people that we have more than 60 years of age. And as you can see, in approximately 40 years, we might be seeing a doubling of the amount of people in the world that is over age 60. And the majority of these people is not gonna be in Europe or in rich countries, it's going to be in less developed nations. Aging, healthy living, and being able to sustain a healthy trajectory of aging is a top priority, not just for the developed countries, but for the entire planet. This has meant that in the last 20 years, we have seen a huge change in, to in terms of what causes mortality and morbidity in the world. While in 1990s, the top three were still infectious diseases. Right now, even during the pandemic, we have non-communicable disorders such as cardiovascular disease, such as a stroke, such as diabetes, being among the top causes of mortality and morbidity in the world. This has been uh, adequately accepted by the United Nations in the General Assembly during the meeting on the 24th of January 2012, with setting up the objective 2525 that the world is embracing basically to reduce premature mortality due to some key NCDs such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, COPD, etc by 25% between the year 20, 2010 and the year 2025. And to achieve this, the WHO has provided us a guidance in terms of the Global Action Plan, which highlights what could be the priorities to be able to achieve that, to reduce by 25% to stop non-communicable disorders. Now, what can we expect from the future? What can we expect of prevention tomorrow? Tomorrow, in the future, by 20, uh, 2040, we might expect a further consolidation of the diseases in blue, which is basically diseases that are non-transmissible, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, COPD, and others. Consequently, with these top conditions that is affecting the whole world, not just the rich countries, but throughout the world, we see that the top key risk factors that are affecting the population are high levels of blood pressure, high levels of body mass index, basically obesity, high levels of glucose, tobacco, pollution, et cetera, the key risk factors associated with non-communicable disorders. In that sense, towards the future, we need to move in two, uh, in two directions. One is embracing the reality and the tools that we have right now and utilizing the technology to be able to further reach the population. And in that sense, I would like to highlight six points. The first one is we need to integrate and eliminate conceptual barriers that is keeping prevention to be able to reach as much people as they should. 
we talk about prevention in terms of primary, secondary, and tertiary, like it's for a large population, some population, and those that are at a higher risk. And in the future, we need to talk about one prevention, integral prevention, with an objective which is and should be health, health, and health. Because so far, healthcare is focused not on healthcare, but disease care. And we are focusing too much on disease and treating disease rather than maintaining, preventing, and recovering from disease. Objective of this prevention is the entire population. And these key pillars of prevention that we will talk uh, in the next slides are actually essential for everyone throughout the world. How? Lifestyle, behavior, education, facilitating the access to information, improving access to healthcare, and reducing inequalities. Understanding prevention as a departure point, the destiny, and the integrating nucleus that promotes all activities in healthcare. A healthcare that is not just uh, controlled by hospitals or controlled by industry, but in which the key nucleus, the key important factor is the population and the individuals, and in which we all work together with charities, with academia, with industry, and with governments, with a single goal, which is to maintain, recover, and uh, facilitate the access to health and healthcare services. As technology advances, we need to increase the amount of utilization of technology, and we need to move towards a new era of evidence-based prevention and public health. So far in epidemiology and public health, the studies that we do is we invite people, like in these studies of the Rotterdam study of Generation R, we invite them to a center, we collect information from them, we do research with them, but in the future, we need to move towards more portals and larger uh, populations in which there is a bi-directional communication and we have now the technological means to be able to gather this information and facilitate a bi-directional interaction with the user, with the person that study. There's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence will play a role, but it cannot replace yet our capacity to facilitate the access to prevention and to communicate prevention in terms of the general population. And we have many sources of technology that can be incorporated facilitating the use of data to enhance prevention. At the same time, we need to simplify our communication to the population in general. Unify the concepts under a single pillar of prevention, which is hygiene. And hygiene is not just washing your hands, but keeping yourself clean or helping yourself to clean yourself from other toxins, sleeping well, doing good levels of physical activity, eating well, avoiding cigarettes, other substances, alcohol, etc. And that goes not only from the individual level, but also the population and planetary level, reducing pollution, emissions, facilitating access to healthcare and facilitating and promoting a healthy lifestyle. We also need to disseminate prevention and integrate it at all levels. It's not just for the cardiologists, it's not just for the otorhinolaryngologists, it's not just for the gastroenterologists, it's for the entire healthcare system. Prevention should be the main uh, point of departure and the patient, the person, should be the main concept that should be embraced within prevention. We have new challenges and we need to adapt to these new challenges and we need immediate solutions. We have the tools, we have humans, we have medicine, we have artificial intelligence and within Bern, for example, we have tried to bring this all together within the Center for Artificial Intelligence in Medicine called KIME. And in KIME, there are projects on education, dissemination, infrastructure and coordinated research that focuses on artificial intelligence in different aspects such as screening, improving diagnostics, improving the management of patients, but also helping to discover new treatments. Will we all end up like Terminator? I'm not sure. We're already seeing how a technology has uh, facilitated and probably will continue to integrate more with our systems, with our populations, to enhance our ways of living, to enhance our health, and to facilitate our function in this planet. Just to end with the slide uh, that I started, prevention, in my opinion, is the key factor for the future of healthcare. We are not going to reach the SDGs if we don't invest and emphasize and focus more on prevention. And if we continue focusing on precision medicine without taking into account that pre prevention is the fundamental pillar, we will exhaust all our resources to be able to accomplish our goal. Thank you for your time. And I give the word to Professor Thomas Bale.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Oscar. And uh, I think I didn't see your presentation before, but I see uh, that it fits very well uh, with my presentation. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, still prevention medicine, but the use of technologies and looking at how technologies can basically help uh, in prevention medicine. And um, okay. And my talk will be a little bit provocative. I will be uh, basically trying to open the floor to questions because here we are specialists in public health. And the first question that um, I want to ask is whether or not digital health has been overlooked in preventive medicine. And I will try to answer this question through uh, a couple of slides. Um, what happens now is uh, when it comes to preventive medicine, the place where data is collected the most are hospitals or clinics or general practitioner. So I want to just check if my body is, is doing well, then uh, my heart rate will be taken uh, by ECG, my blood pressure will be taken, or my respiration rate, or my oxygen saturation. Everything will be basically taken um, at the general practitioner, at the hospital, or in the clinic. When I left uh, um, Switzerland for Dubai at the end of 2018, I asked my uh, patient medical record at the hospital, and the first question that they asked me is, do you have a fax number? And uh, I really didn't have a fax number. So, so this is to say that um, basically at the moment, the use of digital uh, technology is relatively low, may that be uh, in Switzerland or in other countries uh, uh, in the world. If you um, look at what is going on when it comes to, um, to digital health, um, so 90% of Swiss adults have a smartphone. Here in the UAE, a uh, UAE citizen has 2.2 smartphones, so I have only one, so I'm pretty sure that my colleague Shata has at least two in Swiss, not three. 20% um, of Americans have a smartwatch, and um, people buy more Apple Watch than um, Swiss watches, so which means that uh, we are ready to embrace uh, digital health, but uh, the question is, are clinicians and hospitals ready uh, as well? So what we have at the moment is that we have technologies and we have devices that can take more or less the same measurements that I show you at the beginning, but not only one time at one place, but continuously in a non-invasive way and regardless where you are. And uh, we all heard about the white coat syndrome when it comes to blood pressure. This does not happen when you take your blood pressure from home with your mobile device. And there are so many applications and so many technology that is now available. There is um, a technology that was presented at the CS in Las Vegas, which is called uh, um, Biospectcal, which is like a Swiss company that has developed an algorithm that is certified in order to um, take the blood pressure. It was developed uh, in, in Lausanne at, at the Shuv, and they were able to basically match the same um, numbers as the, the professional uh, measurements. So we, we basically, we have the technology, and what we already have as well is that we have the capacities from these mobile devices and this other platform to basically create customized digital interventions that can basically help people to change their behavior towards the better. Um, so we have the technologies and uh, people are using it, but the question is, does it really work? So um, this is more uh, of a scientific uh, a panel that we have here. So let's have a look at uh, what science uh, is telling us. So if you have a look at the use of Apple Watch, for instance, in order to detect atrial fibrillation, there was um, among the largest clinical trial ever conducted uh, that happened in collaboration um, between Apple and Stanford University with almost half a million people, which is um, extremely decent for a clinical trial, uh, they were able to detect 84% um, of the atrial fibrillation, which is um, extraordinary basically for a device that, that everyone uh, almost I is wearing. So we know that from um, some wearable technologies, we are able to almost match, basically, um, the data that we collect um, in hospital. Um, if we have a look at, um, at rings, such as the, the, the OVA ring, we also know that this device is able to collect data and then send intervention that can really help people change their behavior. And we have the fact, so we know that, that it works. For instance, here from a, a randomized uh, a trial of uh, 12 months. So it's not like just we, we do it over, over one day, that was um, over the year. 
And um, we also know from a systematic literature review that was conducted um, two years ago that digital intervention are basically a means that is efficient and that is effective um, in case of uh, um, relieving patients suffering from cancer from pain and helping them to find a better lifestyle. So we have a lot of evidence and science says that, okay, these technologies, they work, they are efficient, and they do have an impact on behavioral change and on uh, preventive health. But then what is it not necessarily as uh, efficient as it is in the real life? Because what we talk about so far are just um, studies and prototypes and pilots. So why aren't digital health technologies used uh, in the real life? So from what I've seen, um, I have four different points. The first one is about the mindset. So um, I work a lot with physicians and I spend half of my time in hospitals. And when we talk about digital health technologies, um, people, when I say people, it's health professionals, either they are afraid, they don't understand, or they don't trust this technology. And uh, Professor Aska talked before about um, artificial intelligence. Uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, very often we hear about, okay, will inter intelligence artificial replaces me as a physician? Or what is artificial intelligence? We, we conducted um, a study and we asked 200 physicians um, around the world and Basically, we came to realize that only 3% of these physicians, they really know what artificial intelligence really is. Of course, 89% of them, they heard about artificial intelligence and machine learning. But when you ask them, okay, what are some of the components of machine learning? What is um, supervised machine learning? What is unsupervised machine learning? What is feature selection? They, they never heard of it, which basically shows that they just understand part of it and they just touch the first layer but they don't really understand how they could leverage um, this concept. The second one is around the awareness and the education. That is really key and uh, we talk about that today. So nowadays in medical schools, digital health technologies is not that much covered. So we have a research that looked at um, 60 best medical schools around the world and only four of them are basically teaching some elements of digital health. So if we want the future physicians to use these technologies, we need to equip them with the adequate knowledge that can enable them to understand when these technologies can be used and when they shouldn't be used because there are also some context where it's maybe not appropriate to use this technology. So education is extremely important um, at a medical school level but also continuous education is also very important to provide also this knowledge to physicians that are working now in, in hospital. And it is unfortunately not the case. There are very, very few uh, training that are available to, uh, to physicians or to medical professionals. Um, the third one is about um, sharing this data, integrating this data and protecting this data. So it's good to have the data that uh, people are connecting the data, but how can they share this data with their uh, um, medical uh, providers? So I talked before about uh, using fax. So it's now three years since I left Dubai. I'm not quite sure if the hospital would send my, my data um, through email, or I don't know what happens. But at the moment, it is clear that um, it's not easy to share data. So we have now in our mobile devices some functionalities that can allow us to send data to, to hospitals, but hospitals, they're not ready to receive this data because they don't know how to integrate this data and they also don't know how to protect this data. So that's a, that, that's a, that's a real challenge. And the last one is a communication from an intervention perspective. So once we have this data, what can you do with this data? How can we create customized intervention and then send this intervention back basically to, uh, to the people, to the population? I try basically to, to sketch an architecture of a model of preventive health and to see how it would, how it would look like. So the first layer is about the data collection. So we know through wearable technologies, we are able to collect objective data. We talked earlier about subjective data and perceived um, 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 happiness. We can do that through survey-based application. And I think the combination between the objective data and the subjective data basically allow um, the medical care professional to have an understanding of a, of a person's behavior. 
The next layer is about the data storage. And something that we, we haven't talked about today is the notion of personal medical records. So personal medical records should be there basically to enable a patient to store this data, to protect this data, and then to share this data. Because um, the population is moving now. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you uh, who live in Dubai, who, who, who are here today, haven't necessarily uh, um, stay in the same country forever. So we are moving and we need to get our data with us and we need to decide basically whom we want to share our data with and how we want to share our data. And um, the next layer is about the hospital and the clinics where we can basically decide, okay, I want to share my data with hospital one and hospital two, but not with clinic one or not with hospital uh, one or two. So we, we need to decide with which hospitals and clinics we want to share our data. And then this data moves from uh, the personal medical record into the health medical record and become basically available to the hospital but also to the government and to public health authority. Because what happens at the moment is most of the intervention that are given by public health authority, they are coming um, from a top-down approach. So the government or the public health authority are saying, okay, now you guys need to wear a mask or now you guys need to stay home. But there is really not much feedback from the population. So once the intervention is basically given to the population, then the population applies or not. And then, of course, by collecting data, so by the government collecting data, then there is a response that can be collected. But this is a response that comes from a top-down approach. There is nothing that at the moment is bottom up whereby the population can, can decide, okay, this is the data that I would like to share with my government and I want my government to be aware about my action because by using my action and the actions of my, my peers, then we can have a collective understanding of what is going on and then the government can also send some more customi uh, customized intervention for, um, for, for my health. So this is uh, the last slide of my presentation. So for me, uh, preventive healthcare is really trying to use as much data as we have and at the moment we have means to collect data, but I believe that we are not Thank you very much. Thank you to you, Thomas, for being here and uh, for speaking to us live. And also uh, thanks, of course, to Oscar, who is uh, online with us as well. Um, and perhaps at this stage, uh, we could invite any questions either to Thomas or to Oscar. It would be great to be able to, to discuss with you. Yes? I see a question already. Um, perhaps. I see a question uh, here in the front row. Yes. Um, Oscar, do you hear us? I can hear you, Emily. The sound is very low, but I can hear you remotely. OK. Um, hopefully, I'll try to be as loud as I can here on the microphone. Um, That's better. Oscar, um, is there anything that you could comment to or give feedback to um, any sort of interrelations between what you have spoken about and what Thomas has has discussed? Um, we invite you to to share your perspective with us. Mm -hmm. Sure, and, and Thomas, thanks for your presentation. I think it's, it's very complementary to what I was saying earlier about the importance of prevention, about the, the sea of data that we are actually swimming in right now. And I think data by itself or artificial intelligence by itself is not gonna do the trick for us. But it will allow us to get uh, more access to populations, populations that already have the digital tools uh, with whom we can communicate. And it will allow for individuals to empower themselves, inform themselves better, educate themselves better and be able to take better informed choice. So uh, I think digitalization is a, is, a, is a path, is a tool and we as a, as the world, as citizens, as public health practitioners, we need to embrace it as a mean to be able to, to reach more people, to reach the basic principles of prevention. Would you like to respond, Thomas, to, to Oscar? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I cannot disagree with that. I mean, these technologies must be seen as tools that that enable um, both the, the patients, but also um, the public and, and the hospital to better understand what's going on. 
and then to be able to act more objectively, basically. So I couldn't, I couldn't agree more, sorry, with you, Professor Asuka. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. Oscar Thomas, thank you very much for your very interesting presentations. I'd like to to challenge a bit what has just been said with regards to digitalization and technology in, in public health. We had at the pavilion here focus on the SDGs and how technology can be more inclusive. To give you a few examples, 99% of um, premature babies unfortunately die in uh, in uh, lower income countries and in such a context I, and this is due to to simple reasons because of, of lack of, of proper thermal equipment which is a given thing back uh, in in upper middle uh, well upper middle um, income countries the question is how uh, you were mentioning a lot of different equipment such as smart watches and so on and so forth, but I doubt that a lot of people can, can afford such equipments um, in, in, in the most poor countries in the world. How can we make digital health more inclusive for contexts such as humanitarian action or, or other contexts like this? If you have any uh, general response and then a few examples, that would be extremely helpful. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I can start uh, from a technological perspective and, uh, and Professor Oscar, you can uh, continue from a more public health and medicine perspective. So I think that's a very good question. And um, if you look at what happens, uh, what is happening in, um, in Africa, for instance, in very poor country in Africa. So they are relying more and more on mobile devices um, um, to make business and also to uh, pay each other and also to wire money to one another. And um, it's not rare, basically, that in um, very poor country and villages, they have one or two mobile devices that they use in order to keep track on the business. And from these mobile devices, which sometimes are very old, they are still able to access these functionalities that I mentioned before. So which means that when it comes, for instance, to um, skin cancer, with all mobile devices, one can still take a picture of a mole, for instance, and get an answer whether or not it is benign or malignant. So this is available to them. So if you take another example, for instance, for, for eye disease, you can also do that using the camera. You can see if you have uh, um, eye, um, eye, um, degenerated eye, eye disease as well. And um, it's the same um, for all the types of, of, um, of, um, of applications. So um, I believe that um, it is entirely true that um, there are not that many Apple Watch in very poor countries in Africa, that is for sure. But on the other hand, they do have mobile devices and they can use these mobile devices, leverage these technologies in order to access services that they wouldn't be able to access otherwise. So um, I believe that um, the technology is spreading even in very poor country because they realize that they can also use these mobile devices to do other things and they put all their money together from one village and they decide to buy one mobile phone and then they could use this mobile phone as well for uh, medical purposes. And you will find many examples um, as well and many studies that basically show the positive impact of mobile devices on the health of, uh, um, I would say, um, um, less developed uh, countries and, uh, and villages. Thank you, Thomas. And I agree with you. And from my side, I'm originally from Colombia. Before moving to Europe, I used to work as the doctor in a village. And we will have people or patients that will come to me after nine or 10 hours in a horse or in a mule. And quite often the questions that they will bring uh, nowadays with the access to mobile technology, I could have answered maybe 60, 70% of the consultations mm -hmm. remotely. And what we have seen in, in low and middle income countries is a, a huge increase in the, in, in the amount of mobile devices that people actually have. And with improvements in internet connections, and this needs to continue and needs to be expanded further, with improvements in internet connection, that means that we are going to become every time more accessible uh, to these remote populations that are in need of urgent care. 
So I, I do think digitalization is, is ready and has played an important role during the pandemic. And during the pandemic, I have seen and interacted with many people throughout the world, uh, especially in Latin America, uh, remotely. And we are able to talk, you are in Dubai, I'm here uh, in Europe, and we are able to talk right now uh, live. So in the same way, we can access people and can help people remotely. And they don't need to travel so many so, so far, so many hours, so, so long, long distances to be able to access healthcare. We have the, the technology, we have the devices. We need to facilitate and integrate it better into care pathways. Um, Oscar and Thomas, thank you very much. I would also like to challenge a bit what I have seen, uh, at least some discrepancy between Thomas and, and Oscar, and I wonder whether you might sit together to continue to build the model. I like that Thomas comes up with... Uh, new model, but I mean, Oscar has very clearly talked about where the future is in his very first slide. It is prevention. And I was talking about a colleague in over, over the lunch here on the rooftop um, about the situation in, in Dubai. Uh, if it's about health, I mean, it's not about prevention. They build hospitals, 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 hospitals. They do the exact same thing as we did in Switzerland, and prevention has absolutely no place. And now Thomas steps in and designs a new model. And guess what? On the third level, there is nothing but hospital, 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 hospital. So I'm very much concerned that this data end up in the hands of those people who are not interested in prevention have no clue about in prevention it's not their task it's not what they, it's not their knowledge so for me those constituencies are missing in your model because the government cannot take that role either because people don't want to be guided and share the data necessarily with the government so who are these other constituencies oscar and thomas do you have any idea because there is a, a, a missing element in this very nicely started plan for building a new model Maybe, Thomas, you want to first defend your model, and then Oscar. OK, so, so the, first, um, the first comment is that a, a model is basically a simplified representation of the reality. And what I tried to, to show there, there was more to um, talk about digital health technology, what we could do now. So that was my, my focus was, what, what can we do now with the model with the existing framework that we have now. Because when I thought about the model, there are so many different layers that I haven't mentioned because I didn't want to uh, put too much complication because, I mean, for me, the main goal of digital health is basically to move the hospital to the home. This is, for me, the main goal of digital health is basically to avoid that people have to go to hospital to do things or treatment that they can do home. This is for me the, the goal of, of digital health. And um, I do believe that this is changing and this is going to change. And the role of the hospital is changing as well, but very slowly. And of course, there are many other actors that, that are not mentioned in this model. Is for instance, if you look at basically the role of health insurances at the moment, what do they do is basically, uh, they basically try to, to cover you as uh, least as they can, and then trying to encourage you to do more other things on your own. But they are not playing the goal of, uh, of a guide. For me, a health insurance should guide you. The health insurance should basically help you to have a better lifestyle. When we talk about uh, value-based medicine, for instance, a concept that is extremely old, that starts to be a little bit implemented in the US, is not something that is extremely common, but that be in hospitals or in health insurances. So I believe that this model was very simplified. And for me, the goal is not to build more and more hospitals, because if you look at the hospital business, basically, it's not about helping patients to feel better. It's basically, again, working on the sick uh, um, exactly. patient model. It's not about preventive yeah. medicine, and exactly. that was that was basically the goal of my of my of my talk and the initial question that I have, is that is digital health overlooked when it comes to preventive medicine? Because mm -hmm. there is no notion of preventive medicine from my perspective, and I believe that this technology could basically be the first layer that could constitute a preventive medicine concept 
But on top of that, we need to have policies, we need to have actors being together, we need to create a cost system. But this is not something that I wanted to present in my model. My model was more meant to explain, okay, we have this data, how can this data be shared and be leveraged by other entities? So that was basically the goal of so the So Oscar, of the which uh, institutions would you put there? Who, who should receive the data to act in the direction of prevention? Because we know hospitals don't do that. Yes, no, hospitals are good to, to take care of disease, but they are not the places where health is actually being designed or implemented. Health is implemented at family level, at community level. That data needs to reach the individual and the communities. And we need to be able to inform, educate, and facilitate that people have access to their information, communities have access to their information, and they can in interaction with other partners, be it the government, be it the, the local uh, representat rep representatives can facilitate the, the enhancement of their environment and the ways of living in order to make prevention just uh, not a luxury, but a fundamental right for everyone who is living in this planet. Uh, I know this sounds like a large revolution. It doesn't have to change from one day to another. We still need hospitals right now. We uh, we should also aim at this goal that Thomas was mentioning of moving hospitals toward their homes. While this is happening, while this transitioning is happening, while we're empowering communities and individuals, uh, I think we are going to have to continue pushing towards the agenda of prevention above the economical uh, principles of treating healthcare as a business and hospitalization as a way of treating health. Hospitalization is the end result of not taking care of people's health not taking care of people's prevention. And we need to change the, the, the paradigm and the way that we are seeing healthcare and populations uh, towards the future, Nino. You know. Having said that, Nino, you know, I think both Thomas and, and my presentation are complementary. And I think what Thomas is highlighting is an, an end of care for a group of population and, and also that is presenting a transition in which we could move uh, from a hospital center uh, healthcare system to a community center healthcare system, individual center healthcare system. Thank you very much, Oscar. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, round of applause from us here um, to you. Thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, we couldn't agree more. What an excellent um, complimentary uh, talk from you both and great to see a uh, Swiss perspective and also uh, a connection also from the UAE um, here. Uh, that's very appropriate and very, very relevant for us that we could connect Switzerland and the UAE in this kind of discussion. Um, so thank you once again to you both. And this is now the, the closing of this session, but I invite all of you who are joining here at us here live and also online to please do reconnect with us after the break uh, where, we will, where we invite the WHO uh, from Europe um, in this special event on the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which uh, is set to be very, very interesting for us, especially because uh, we had plenty of questions earlier about uh, things like vaccine hesitancy, about things about the pandemic in general, and all of these topics will certainly be addressed uh, in, this, in this upcoming session. So please do stay tuned. Uh, we invite you to take a break now and join Join us once again at 5 p.m. UAE time. Thanks very much and all the best. Goodbye. Thank you.